Thank you for coming. We have a really important topic here today for the talks at Google. It's my pleasure to be able to introduce and MC the next hour with Kyra Kyles. She's here to talk to us about a very important topic. One of my colleagues actually heard her speak at a conference, and we felt compelled to really help broadcast the message. Diversify or die, why news media need to reflect their audience. What we'll do is we'll hear from Kyra, speak for, uh, go through the presentation. We'll have a discussion. I'll ask a few questions. We have some open mics uh, for a lively Q&A. To tell you a little bit about Kyra, she is the co-founder of Myth Lab Entertainment. She founded this company with her sister. It's a multicultural agency, multi-platform. She's also the former editor-in-chief of Ebony Magazine. So without further ado, please welcome Kyra Kyles. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Good. Good. Wonderful. So uh, thank you so much for the warm introduction. And it's really great to be here. I really appreciate people coming out to talk about a topic that is extremely important to me. Um, as Natalie mentioned, you know, I've been in the journalism industry for about 20 years. And it's interesting that the industry has changed in so many ways, especially as it pertains to technology and the advertising models. But there's one area where I feel that it's woefully behind. And that's why I'm here with the uh, dawning title to diversify or die, because sometimes you have to scare people in order to make them make a change. So we're going to go with the minority report now. So just to give you a little bit more detail about me, I did work at Ebony Magazine, where I was the editor in chief and also the senior vice president of digital editorial. And honestly, that is the first black owned company that I worked for. And Ebony is an interesting story because this is a 70 plus year old company. And the reason it was started is because even back then, of course, there was a dearth of positive news or affirming news or even just factual news about African Americans. And it's, it's sad to me in a way that something like that is needed. I mean, we obviously love it and we're excited about that and other black owned and black run media entities. But the fact is this problem, you know, has, is predates most of us and it still continues. So I also have had the benefit of working with a lot of mainstream outlets and that's what gives me some perspective in terms of I came from Tribune. I worked with the Sun Times. I've worked with Vibe.com, worked with a number of dailies. And even in college, it was already obvious to me that there was a majority of white males, to be honest, at, at these places. And because of that, there was a certain perspective. None of this, I think, is malicious. I don't think it's done to X anyone out. But there are just certain factors that are affecting us. And I think we have to be cognizant about it, not only as participants, like someone like me, but our audience, you know, someone like you, and that you're empowered here at Google to be able to do something about it because you're such a huge factor uh, with the media industry. So I'll tell you a little personal story about how I figured out, really, that I could never, never, never leave the journalism industry because, I don't know, I, it's like there are so few of us, we feel compelled to remain within it, even though it can be very brutal and punishing at times. You know, we, we're losing ad revenue, we're losing people many times, but there, this is one of the reasons why. So Hurricane Katrina. Um, I was in the newsroom at the time, and I was one of a handful of African-American journalists where I worked. Most of the black people, to be quite frank, that worked there were um, in the secretarial pool, administrative security. There were not very many black journalists. So one day I was called down to the big boardroom, you know, and I was kind of intimidated because I'm thinking, typically, you know, the big editors don't call down like an editor or reporter. At the time I was a columnist. What on earth did I do? So I'm thinking, did I write something wrong in a story? You know, is there like a bunch of people with pitchforks waiting for me outside? Like what happened that they're calling me into this room? And what happened is it was Hurricane Katrina had hit. Uh, everybody was scrambling to do coverage. And so these editors called me down to this big boardroom with these, you know, all these books and leather bound books and couches. And what they wanted to ask me is if I thought it was OK if they referred to those affected by Hurricane Katrina as refugees. So I was like, OK, um, hmm. first of all, let me tell you that I cannot 
exonerate you no matter what you do. I, I, you know, I, I like to think of myself as very regal, but I'm not the queen of blackness. There's nothing, you know, no wand I can wave and say, this is what you should do and you won't get in trouble. But I will answer your question with a question. If something happened in Iowa or Idaho or here in Chicago, would you refer to the people affected as refugees? And they immediately said no. So I think I'm glad they asked. I'm not grateful that they asked, they should ask, but I'm glad that they asked and that I was there to talk to them about this because it could have been a very big misstep. But I think that's, that's what brings us here today is that because there were so few people there up in those higher echelons, they honestly were going to go with that had I not said anything. And it, hadn't occur it did occur to them to ask, which is important, but the fact is that they couldn't come up with a consensus without asking me is another issue. So you might recognize this frame. So media is definitely failing its multicultural audiences. And this is Dear White People, which, by the way, is very good on Netflix if you haven't seen the show. And um, I, I don't think that this is a point that, that we can go over too much. I think people believe sometimes that there's just like this small descending minority of people who want to see all this positive news about multicultural groups. And I really don't think that's true. I think people just want to see factual accurate reporting. They want to see nuance. They want to see stories that are not just crime or stories that are not just about race or politics. They want to see stories that reflect the American population. So when I say that to people, sometimes they think, well, you know, there's been some progress. But the fact of the matter is there hasn't been enough progress comp considering the American population, which I'll go into. So what I've done with the presentation is I have put some factoids in here because I think, you know, when, you, when you're telling personal stories, people kind of get it. But I think if you see numbers, then people totally get it. So this one is don't sleep and for obvious reasons. You know, we, I think we take a lot of things for granted, especially in America regarding our population, but in just five years, about 50.2% of children born in the United States will be minorities. So the whole definition of minority is changing. Um, in 2020, white children will be the minority in the United States, and this is according to the census. And then in 2060, you know, this is really jarring, 62% of the population that identifies as white will drop all the way down to about 44%. So when you see these newsrooms, and things are changing in certain areas, but when you go to a lot of traditional newsrooms, what you will see is you know, white, older males. And that does not at all reflect the population. So there are issues and things that are lost in translation because of that. So, and I know this as well as anyone, you would love to believe that maybe media coverage will change because people are just awesome, and people are awesome, but it's not just altruism that's gonna get us to this next area. So I think it's important for people to realize what the potential of this market is. And so I'll just go over a couple of the stats that I have here, but for example, magazines. I came from the magazine industry. We all know that print magazines are not doing very well just because the advertising model has shifted so much. But of the mainstream population, which 55% are reading magazines, minority populations read 65%. So there's an over-index there. In terms of radio, you know, everybody talks about the death of radio. When you've got podcasts, we've got all these technologies coming out. However, minority communities are listening to 20 hours of radio a week compared to 10 hours for just the mainstream population. Um, in terms of apps, watching videos, which is another really important area also for advertising, because people are always slipping those little videos in there. 56 hours a month, that's what black uh, citizens alone are, are watching on their apps. Um, they're 81% more likely to show support for a brand, which is super important because we always talk about brand influencers and people that can tout your brand, especially in a crowded marketplace. And th this is extremely important to note, 76% will share their opinions you know, on some of the social media outlets. So I think that's important to think about because when things don't go right, you know, it can, it can be an ugly situation. I'm sure we've all heard you know, the term black Twitter and we've all heard the, about dragging and it, it is a real thing. You know, I've, I've only been kind of dragged once, like just a light tug, but I can promise you that I don't want any more of that. So I, I definitely advise against being dragged. Um, the, another reason that African-American audience is important is that it's becoming much a more educated community. Um, household income is increasing. I think because we see so many of these stories and headlines that talk about what isn't going right, you know, the crime rates or um, issues with Black Lives Matter, because of that, th there is sort of almost like a blind spot with the mainstream media when it comes to this population. And that is why I believe there's so much like story ideation around these negative uh, developments. 
and I do miss President Obama. Sorry, I had to say that. I know everybody's going home. So 75%, I think this is horrible. 75% of African Americans distrust the media that they read. So if you think about it, and that's insulting to me, actually, as somebody who went to school for this, worked hard on fact checking, for me to be writing something and you know, when I was maybe in more of a mainstream outlet, I don't think I experienced this as much when I was at a black owned pub publication. For somebody to be giving me the side eye to the rate of 75%, that is extremely high. And I think that demonstrates that this is not a problem that is just among a small group of people. This is widespread. And I'll tell you why, you know, and I have some examples. The funny thing is, whenever I talk about this topic, it takes me two seconds to find a new example. I wish I could bring you an example from 2016 and say, oh, this is back in the bad old days. No, I have a very fresh example for you. So I won't go through all of these because I really do want to get to talking to everybody about this issue and what your thoughts are on it. But I'll just highlight a few, the ones that make me the most physically ill. We'll start with Miss Kardashian. No shade to the Kardashian clan. They are doing their thing. However, Kim Kardashian by no means invented cornrows. The fact that a magazine would put out a story saying that she created this trend called boxer braids, which basically is the way my mother used to braid my hair when I would swim when I was like seven years old. I was like, this is a slap. I mean, did you do any research? Did you ask anyone? Have you ever been anywhere? Because that, to me, it was just so galling. And I think it really offends um, individuals. I have in the audience here today, Wendy Wilson, who's one of my colleagues from Ebony. And we talked about that in the fashion industry in particular, it seems like there is just this, this blindness towards black women. And, and this is an example of it. Here's another one that made me irate when um, the New York Times referred to Viola Davis as not classically beautiful. According to who? Did they not see her at the Golden Globes when she was serving with her yellow dress? I mean, it was just the, the nerve of someone to come up with something like that. And when you say classically beautiful, you understand what the implication is. What does that mean, that she's not blonde, that she's not, you know, what are you saying when you talk about that? No, she does not necessarily look like Scarlett Johansson, but is there not room in the spectrum for her to be considered beautiful as well? Um, the Mike Brown situation, uh, when in Ferguson, when the news outlets, and I, again, I don't think this was purposeful. I think it was because they were racing against the clock. You're trying to get new information. But a lot of the stories show the image on the left, if you can see it, where he's putting up his hand. And I don't necessarily think it is a, a gang symbol or something, but there's somewhat of an implication there. And then on the right, you know, you see him just living his life. Or you could have used a graduation picture. You could have used something else. The bottom line is that a lot of media outlets hit back and said, hey, we were under time crunch. We got This is the picture that we had. We had to run with it. However, I think it's obvious that in many cases, when there's a story about a, a white teen, even in a similar situation, they will get a graduation picture, a picture with family, something that doesn't have any sort of a negative connotation. And people noticed that. And it actually started a trending topic on the aforementioned black Twitter of what photo will they use when I die? Because any one of us you know, has taken a picture that we might not necessarily want to see again. And to use that as the photo, it does definitely sway public opinion. And I can admit to you, the, the outlet that I was working with, we were in the same position. We did use that photo because honestly, when I looked at it, I didn't see it as being in any way nefarious. But once the public said, hey, guys, this picture is bad. Please take this down or find something else. We did. The issue is when people say something or when the public speaks out and then no one, no one responds. And then this is my fave. Oh, boy. So we recently had the, the revelation that um, how to show natural hairstyles. So I don't know if you can see the picture on the bottom right. They had a story about how to rock natural hairstyles um, in Pop Sugar, and every single woman in this story was white. Now, I understand that all hair is natural when it comes down to it. You know, unless you're growing some kind of acrylic out of your head, everything is natural. But black women have clearly taken this term and we're using it for the purpose that we have not traditionally been able to wear our hair as it grows out of our heads in a traditional workplace. I mean, there's still legislation that allows you to fire someone if they have locks. So we are not at a place where we can, you know, all lives matter to hair. You know, so when this publication did this, the retribution was swift. But my question was, why did you ever do this? You know, if you had just 
had somebody around, somebody diverse in your circle, this never would have happened. Some of these things are totally avoidable, and that's the issue. And the last one I'll point out, and this is because, again, I don't think this is malicious, but extremely hurtful, that Cosmo did a lineup of trends that were you know, dead, like RIP, goodbye, you ugly trend. And then they had hello, gorgeous, and they were ushering in the new beautiful trends. About 90% of the goodbye, ugly trend were black women and models. Joanne Smalls, like, it, it was terrible. But I don't think, again, it was not done deliberately, but, and they apologized for it. But the fact is, no one looked at this lineup and thought this could be a problem. You know, that, that is the problem. So again, sad that the examples continue. So what are we looking for? You know, Naomi's clapping it up for us. We are looking for fair representation. No one is looking for to be treated better than anyone, just like you don't want to be treated worse than anyone. What we're looking for is even simple issues, stock art. I, and I had this happen. I will not name the agency. But one day, just out of curiosity, I decided to do a search in this popular stock art agency's collection. And I put in the word ghetto. If I didn't get back, every black person known to man that was in their catalog, I could not believe it. I mean, and this happened in 2016. Um, most of the images are of people of non-color. It's very hard to find any sort of minority in the stock art. So I think the issue is that, and, and it's being remedied um, within the community. I know several women, for example, who started agencies where they take pictures and they make it available to the media's use so that there are these, these different um, images out there. But the sad fact is that in these major agencies, there's only a very tiny and microscopic selection you have to choose from. And that's why if you look, you'll notice that you kind of see the same feature images in a lot of stories, and that is why because there just are not a lot of images of people of color, period, not just African Americans. Um, I think asking people to be part of stories that are not about race, that are not about class, that are not about politics, asking people questions about riding bikes. You know, I ride bikes somewhat, you know, not very well, but I do. You know, I would like to be interviewed, you know, for stories that don't necessarily base upon the way that I look, you know, as a person. Like, we're all humans, we're all Americans, and we're all global citizens. Why shouldn't we be included in other stories? Um, being authentic in it, showing people, you know, just because it's cool, you know, for example, um, I think sometimes like people fixate on a certain pop culture citizen, like a, you know, this is an unpopular topic right now, but a black China, for example, or something like that. And the people just discovered who this is. It's like, come on now, you know, and they go all in and they give them covers and they give them this and it just rings false because it's obvious that you're not interested in anyone else. You're just interested in specific black people that are undeniably popular at the moment. And otherwise, this wouldn't be something that you would work very hard at. So that can be a, a huge problem. Um, I think even what I learned when I was in school, that the uh, professors always told us, um, interviewing a lawyer, interviewing a professor, make an effort, especially if it's not a story based around race, to talk to people of different areas of the spectrum because you want to mirror the populace. And I think that unfortunately, because people are in a rush and they have these circles of people that they talk to, they just want to continue in that vein, but I think we just really have to ask ourselves to expand. And there are publications that are doing a much better job, because I don't like to keep it all negative. You know, I want to talk about some good success stories. Washington Post has been doing an incredible job. Um, Huffington Post Black Voices does a great job. You know, with a small staff, they're able to cover a lot of issues. They have a lot of op-eds, but they also do really good investigative reporting. There's, they stress the importance of covering black community across the diaspora. BuzzFeed is doing a really good job. And what I really want to commend them for is transparency. What, what I've run into um, as a member of the National Association of Black Journalists um, is that news outlets don't want to tell you who they have there. They, like, we're, we're a group of people that are always asking questions, but this is a question that we don't want to answer. So you don't know what the proportions are. Even when they do surveys, there's a low return of, of, of organizations that will provide background. So BuzzFeed did that. You know, they talk about how many people they have. They talk about black. They talk about Asian. They talk about women. They let people know what they're doing. And yes, you open yourself up to criticism. Someone could look at that and say, well, that's not enough. But the bottom line is, I think that if you open yourself up to that criticism, it shows that you are willing to fix it. And when you hide it, it makes it seem like you want to keep things in the status quo. And I think another important question for us to ask, you know, I know that, as I said, Google is extremely important, but even just as individuals, 
we can do things. You know, something that I just did recently, and I was just using my own example because I don't want to put anyone else out there on Front Street necessarily, but a friend of a friend of a friend of mine went into a 7-Eleven in Chicago. She, she, she was a mother. She sent her two boys that were teenagers, like very young boys, into the store to pick up food for their lunch. And within minutes, they were back outside with nothing. And she asked them what happened. And the little boys, they just said, you know, it's no problem. He just didn't want us in there because we're black. It's okay. And she was like, wait a minute. What? That is not okay. She put, took them back in the store. She asked the clerk what he did. And I think he told on himself because he, when asked about it, what he, sa he said something to her to the effect of, well, I'm an American. Like, what, you, what is this an immigration office? It's a 7-Eleven. You know what I mean? Like, what does living in America have to do with anything? But that little video of her encountering this man and really confronting him about what he did to her sons, I posted it. I encouraged a lot of other people to post it. News outlets got into it. And from what I understand, he was removed from that store. So there are things that we as individuals can do with the power of smartphones, with the power of social media. If we see things Things that we don't like, there's something that we can do in response. Back in the day, there was the letter to the editor that could take months to surface, and you know the reaction would be equally slow, very glacial. But now, I think there's an immediate reaction. Now, you don't want to jump the gun. Everything is not a racial situation, but I think it is extremely important that we take our voices and that we channel those into positive change. Because the bottom line is that, as I said, the demographic is changing. The country is changing, the globe is changing, and the last thing we want to do is have the media that's supposed to be a catalyst for revolution, you know, be the one that's kind of putting down the revolution. So that's, that's pretty much everything that I wanted to, to say to you, and I'd love to hear what you have to say to me about the topic. I know it can be hot button, and sometimes people can be a little fearful about bringing up the, the, the issues, but I think that's the only way that we'll ever come to a solution. So thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kyra. Oh, this is you have a powerful voice well, and such a strong message. And uh, you know, it is a, a, a tough topic, but with with staggering statistics like this, yeah. we have to bring change. And it doesn't come quick. It doesn't come easy. It's been a long time coming. But um, by having this conversation here today and and the impact that you've had in the industry, um, it's a start. And it, there are ways that we can also take action. Yes. I'd like to just start learning a little bit more about you. Sure. Uh, you just, how did you get in the industry? You had an accelerated master's program at Northwestern, dove right into journalism. Right. What sparked that interest? You know, I've always been interested in mm -hmm. writing ever since I was a little kid. I often tell the story that my mom used to occupy my time when I was a child by putting me in front of a dressing room mirror, and I would sit there and do these little broadcasts so she could shop, 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 and I would be doing the <laughs> weather and talking about the news. <laughs> I even had a Barbie magazine with my sister that we forced my poor father to read. He'd come home from work exhausted and have this terrible magazine, you know, printed out and ready for him to read. So it's funny because oftentimes people say they want to be something when they're little, and then that doesn't materialize. So in my case, that is exactly what happened. Amazing. Yeah. And you, you, you veered into the print media. You've also, you're heavily involved in multi-platform, um, and you've kind of dabbled in each form, if yes. you will. Uh, on this topic of diversity and in the topic of media, are there some sub-verticals that are doing it better than others, whether it's broadcast, prime time, newspapers, digital? I would say just by design, because digital typically is it's a younger workforce, it's um, more malleable, there aren't these entrenched employees and entrenched ways of doing things. Digital seems to be leading the way. For example, I believe it's about double the number of women working for some of these online outlets compared to your traditional dailies. So they are far and beyond leading the way. And I think they've actually worked collectively to bring up the statistics of the number of minorities in media when added with these traditional outlets. TV, I believe, is mm -hmm. among the slowest, if I'm not mistaken. And I and that's probably because it's a visual medium. Like we still have situations, I don't know if if 
uh, most of you saw the story about the, the woman who does the weather who she got all these nasty viewer notes because she was wearing her natural hair on air. And I mean, the things that people said, you would have thought we'd climb into a time machine and gone back, you know, the 1950s or 60s. Because it's a visual medium, it may be harder to adjust and to embrace those trends. And viewers are older, so they're used to seeing certain things. Mm -hmm. So if they wake up and they see someone that doesn't look like what they're used to, they'll turn it off. And because it's such a delicate situation, they need that advertising model, they still continue to follow the audience in that way. So I think unless you had a, a lot of young people tuning in and voicing uh, concerns about what they're seeing, that one is one that will continue to be kind of stagnant. And also behind the scenes is extremely important. A lot of people see people on the front lines. They don't see the directors, the producers, the writers behind the scenes on TV. That is also not very diverse. And in newspapers, you can kind of tell a little bit more. But again, you don't necessarily know the background of, of people that you're reading. But just statistically speaking, mm -hmm. as I understand it, it's about 17% of the total news workforce of those who responded mm -hmm. are minorities at this moment, people of color. So how, with, with such low numbers, how can we bring change? Does it, it, it can't just be in, um, I'll, I'll share a little bit about the Google practice, sure. uh, because we, it's not just at the hiring stage, it's also in the inclusion. Uh, diversity and inclusion is something that's one of our pillars and values at this company, work to be done, and, and that's because also in working on the pipeline of applicants. So there's another pillar that's really critical to Google, which is in education. Inspiring the next generation in thinking about computer science. And the last pillar is our community. How do we make sure that we bring access to everyone, training us and be uh, small and medium-sized businesses or others so that they have the tools to grow? Um, where, how do we start bringing more diverse voices into the world of journalism? Is it in the schools? Is it how, how would you think about that approach? Yeah, I, I definitely think education is a critical piece because you you do need that training in order to go to, into journalism. Though nowadays, some of these sites uh, you might question that. But um, I think one really important thing is that it's still um, kind of a privilege to work in journalism. People mm -hmm. expect you to work for free. Some people can't afford to do that, especially somebody, a person of color, maybe somebody who hasn't inherited familial wealth. They can't afford to do a, a free internship. I've had situations when I was working with Ebony where someone was working in retail and also coming in, but they didn't have enough hours to really make a significant difference. I think that paying interns a decent amount would help because that would give them impetus to join the field and to be trained the right way. And also to then get advocates from within the industry that can reach back and say, hey, I had this really great intern. Here's a role that this person could fill. Um, people always hire from within their circle. I think that's across the industry. Mm -hmm. If you don't know people, you cannot hire them. If you've never met them because they've had to work a regular job because they can't afford to work for free, you know, it's a, it's a moot point to talk about diversity if you're not doing those things. And that goes across the board, um, even in Hollywood. You, people can't afford to work for free for agents and that kind of thing. And that's the reason why you see some of the whitewashing that people talk about in the movies. I think also it's the audience. I think the audience has to demand better. I think they have to call people on the carpet. I recently saw a horrible um, industry article. It was a review of the movie Girls Trip. It I, I don't know what happened here. It was just really pointed and really biased. And instead of evaluating it like you would Bridesmaids, this author decided to compare this movie that has nothing to do with anything to um, Tyler Perry's movies. And I think it was because that was his frame of reference. You know, and that, that would be like comparing the Coen brothers to Seth MacFarlane. It doesn't make right. sense. Right. So, um, you know, I, I think it is about exposure. It's about audience driving change. And it is about, you know, supporting journalists of color. When you see them and they're doing great work, support them on social media, follow them, you know, get more familiar with their work so that they can be touted. You know, we've had several journalists who have gotten that kind of treatment and it really helps, um, you know, and, and I think we just have to continue in that vein. It's, it's not one bullet solution. It's like mm -hmm. a comprehensive change that we're going to have to see. Beautiful. You mentioned, I mean, the, the, the need to have stronger and more inclusive journalism voices. I think there was a stat on your slide about 75% of African Americans actually trust the source of news. That they don't, right. Don't no, trust. Not, so right. So what happens? Is there just um, no more readership or do they turn to different sources? What, I mean, I think people. I think people continue 
to read because this is the information, but I think they take it with a huge grain of salt. They think, okay, the police are always right in these stories that I read. The person that's killed or hurt or put in jail is always wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there has also been a proliferation of blogs and different sites, you know, and I'll say, for example, like Very Smart Brothers, The Root, you know, they're in different areas, some of our entertainment, Shadow and Act, that have come to fill in these gaps. Mm -hmm. And I think they're very successful, but because they don't, they still aren't the juggernauts that some of these other sites are. You know, BET has a huge audience, and so their news really infiltrates, but, you know, some of these smaller sites may be aggregated, they have influence, but they're still not gonna have the, the heft of, say, the Tribune Company, which has all these different affiliates. So, um, I, I do believe it's bringing forth new voices, but I still think bringing forth new voices is effective, but it would be even more effective if we could get some of those voices into the traditional outlets that people read the most. And some of those people that read the traditional outlets are the main ones that need to read the new voices because they're just kind of indoctrinated in what they're accustomed to. And sometimes that's very biased information. It's uh, it's true. There, if we look at another industry, the the movies industry, oh boy, yeah. what happened with the Oscars last year? Yeah. It was pretty blatant in terms of the lack of diversity. And one approach they took, and I don't know if it's the right one for other industries to look at, but they set a number in terms of how they wanted to elevate the number by 2020, I think it was, right. of women and African American Latino writers. What's your perspective on that? I think that's a a good step. Uh, I, again, I do think it also has to be within the rank and file. It has to be the producers. It has to be the, the script writers. It has to be, uh, there have to be more people behind the scenes, the directors, the cinematographers, in order to really make sure that we're seeing movies that reflect the audience that's sitting in front of it. I mean, I'll say, I've been reading recently, and I am a huge Game of Thrones <laughs> fan. I once Winter's broke coming. up with a person because they kept talking during the scenes. I'm like, no, you're going to be quiet or you know, we're done here. Um, but, I mean, it is weird that in this fantasy world where there are dragons and white walkers and zombie horses, you can envision maybe three, four people of color, period. And, and it's weird to people. I think you're coming into a time where people are not willing to accept that. And then on the reverse, we have the Black Panther trailers came out and people lost their minds. What is happening here? <laughs> Why wasn't there a role set aside for Matt Damon? I'm not going to go see this. And it's like, listen, Matt Damon had his turn when he was on the Great Wall of China for reasons unknown. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna let that go. We're gonna let Matt Damon take a bench on this one. But um, I, I think that you, it's got to come from everywhere. Having the judges have more diversity, which is what they did, is great. But if there aren't more movies, it's still not gonna solve anything. We need more movies out with people of color behind as well as in front of the scenes. We do have good visibility in front of the camera and that's getting better, especially on TV. I think television is really doing a great job. But um, you know the industries are old, and they sh they're showing their age. And I think we're now starting to come up against a generation that's not willing to just accept that. They're going to say, "Hey, if you don't make it, we'll go make it ourselves." That's why you saw the success of Get Out. That movie, I don't think it could have been made like five or six years ago. And now, because of the response it's getting, you'll see mm -hmm. more provocative films like that. You know, everything is not. You know, I respect the Tyler Perry because he's doing amazing things. But everything is not Tyler Perry, and nor should it have to be. And that shouldn't be the framework by which movies with a black cast or black executives is judged. Absolutely. It's a shared responsibility from corporations to also the talent producing right. the movies. And it was a, a colleague of mine who pointed out that Disney's Mulan movie, um, they were about to cast a, a white male to be the of the love interest. Right. And uh, it was a petition of 90,000 folks when right. she signed it to, to make a stop and they kind of changed the writers. So th there is a way to have a, a voice. There is. People to yeah, to have an change. immediate voice. And I think mm -hmm. that's important because there used to be a time it would have been a letter writing campaign or something, which is very sluggish mm -hmm. and ineffective. The movie would have been in the theaters by the time people knew about the protest. I think that that, as you point out, that is a terrible thing to do. Why would you do that? There And, and there really is a, a, a galling lack of Asian representation in movies, in pop culture in general. You know, you're starting to see more of that, but not enough. They can't afford to do that at this point. And I'm so glad that people spoke out and I hope that teaches them a lesson because I wanted to see Ghost in the Shell, but I couldn't. Because even though Scarlett Johansson is like one of my Women Crush Wednesdays, I could not do it. <laughs> because you, you know, it's such a huge opportunity that you missed. And I think people need to understand. They may ignore a protest, but when they see the box office numbers drop, 
There's no way to ignore that. And Hollywood is driven by money. So is the media. So if you speak with your dollars and you don't invest, they will figure out a different way to do things. They always have. I'm going to ask you one last question, okay. uh, and then we'll open it up. And we've got some mics here if you want to start lining up with the questions and you're dying to ask Kira. But um, it's a, a little bit more about, you know, we opened up with who are you. I want to also ask you um, a topic that's come up uh, out of our Ann Arbor office, and it is a series, first time I discovered I was black. And that was a Googler who thought of the series, created and produced a 30-minute video segment inspired by what he'd seen on CNN of the same title. When was the first time you realized you were black? It was a wonderful day. I can remember that much. Um, <laughs> you know, I think I was exposed early. I would say maybe the, content, the, the context of color and race and that, maybe when I was about four or five, because I grew up in a predominantly Irish neighborhood. And I didn't, my mother really didn't have a choice. You know, there were children playing with the hair and rubbing on the skin. And I was like, what are they doing? They would ask us, you know, why our dolls were this? Because my mother bought us black dolls because she wanted to reinforce our beauty ideals. So we had some beautiful black dolls. Like one looked like Felicia Rashad. They were so pretty. Oh. And the fact that we had them, you know, Austin caused questions from the kids in the neighborhood. So I believe as early as that, I figured it out. And then my mother, you know, talked to us about it, you know, talked about the differences talked about history to us in a way that we could understand and consume. Mm -hmm. So I felt luckier than some other children when I went to school and they really weren't aware of our history and that, and they seemed to be more subject to being like shamed for being different. Whereas with me, I was like, you're just mad because your hair doesn't do this, you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, I Black had a beauty. different and much more positive, I, you know, feeling about it than if I had come in there and been surprised. You know, you and I were talking uh, earlier today about the sportscaster who, who said that, you know, he, he doesn't know what he is and race doesn't matter anyway. And I mean, I feel like this is a man that he... he he probably should know, you know, at this point. He's about 50 years old. He's, if he's passed at least three mirrors, he should, he should know. But, <laughs> you know, I, the fact that that's still happening, though, that just tells you how fraught with controversy the topic is, identification mm -hmm. and um, embracing your culture. It's still something that is not easy for anyone. For sure, but shouldn't you be able to hear the voice that you had such a beautiful narrative growing up and hearing that story, being able to project your voice right. and to read about like-minded voices as well? Exactly, mm -hmm. right. And I think that's extremely important. You know, in the black community and people of color, I think there's a saying, it's like, you have to see it to be it. You know, seeing mm -hmm. even President Barack Obama ascend that way, you know, kids my age probably didn't think that that could happen just based on the way that society is set up. But there are generations of children that for them, that's a goal. They, they don't even think twice about it because they've seen it. And it, it's sad that we just need to see more examples. And then and people being free to talk about them in, in various outlets and in movies and TV and pop culture. Absolutely. You, you sparked some ideas as well as to how we can do that, sponsorship and, and others. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, we'll turn to um, some live questions and um, pass it over. Thank you so much, Kyra, for coming and speaking with us. Of course. So we've uh, heard a lot, you know, for several uh, women, female executives of color come and speak to us and share their experiences. Some of them actually express that they have uh, felt more discrimination as a woman than as a person of color. So let's get your experiences. You know, does that align to your expectations and uh, your experiences and what you've seen in the media industry, or or, or what? Yeah, what's the situation there? You know, for me personally, and again, this is just for me personally. I feel that blackness cannot be extracted from my womanness. I feel like they're one thing. Um, black women in general are treated differently than white women are treated. I mean, I don't have the statistics with me at the moment, but in, just in terms of being in a workplace and having internal advocates, black women felt much less supported than white women. Now, white women felt much less supported than white men. So it's like they say, you know, the old saying is like, there are levels to this. So I think that, you know, when I come into a room, people see a woman, but I think first and foremost, a lot of times they see a black woman. I don't think I'm able to, you know, I'm a woman now and also a black, you know? <laughs> so I can only speak to mine, but I, I think what I like it because I think I find it empowering. Like that's a double challenge, you know, that I'm facing in society. And for me to be able to make it as far as I've made it, to be able to sit here and address you all. I mean, I think that that 
I hope that inspires other young black girls. I hope that inspires people. I don't want to make light of the challenges that I face and say, oh, no, it's no problem, because I don't want other people who are experiencing problems to think that they you know, are being singled out. No, it's a problem, usually. But my hope is that by doing this and by talking to more people, it will be less of a problem until it's not a problem at all. So that's the goal. But that's an excellent question. And I'm sure there are different people that would answer it differently, too. There's, there's this concept of allies at Google because no matter how you identify, right. you can have sponsors in the room to make sure that your voice is heard. And I think it's something that is work in progress here and that we're also trying to influence in the world, but uh, with and beautiful leaders. And I think that's leaders, super important. I mean, and I, I love that, mm -hmm. that, that that's a priority mm -hmm. because I think sometimes we take for granted that if you work somewhere, you'll get a mentor. They'll just appear to you out of thin air. No, people have to step up. Yeah. And I think that that's great that you're encouraging that so that that's terrific thank you hi my name is Jonathan and first I just want to thank you for taking the time to speak with us it's been a really powerful message uh, throughout your career you've had the opportunity to work at a number of institutions large and small some that have gotten it right some that continue to get it wrong and you gave all those examples earlier where it was almost like how could this happen? How could you get to this point in your creative process or of your, in your execution and no one asked the question and the checks and balances oftentimes came from the public? Uh, would love to know in your experience, what are some of the hallmarks of institutions that get it right and what are some of the checks and balances they establish internally to make sure that the product that they put out is more reflective, is more diverse? Well, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And, and I'll say, to be fair, obviously, it's not just the media industry. I mean, we all saw that tone-deaf um, Kylie Jenner uh, Pepsi ad where she solved Black Lives Matters issues with a carbonated beverage, and somebody bought space for that, you know? And only until people said, what are you doing, did they pull the commercial? I never would have aired it. You know, it was like a Saturday Night Live sketch waiting to happen. Like, you did <laughs> Lauren Michaels work for him. Beyonce's uh, black? What? <laughs> yeah, so, I, well, that wax figure, have you seen that? They have her looking, okay, but anyway, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but um, I would say, in terms of checks and balances, I think it's important to have people of different backgrounds with different experiences in the room. Unfortunately, especially in the United States, I think we have a lot of segregation at work and at home. We have a lot of segregation in terms of who we talk to. So maybe some of these people didn't have a friend that they could say, hey, we're doing something at work and you know, it's gonna be pretty big. I'd like to get your thoughts on it. They may not have had that. So if you don't have that in your friend circle, you should have it at work. And I think what you also need, which is super important, is you need to have people of color in the leadership roles too, because there are sometimes people in the room and they're intimidated to speak. Like when I got called in there for that Hurricane Katrina conversation, I did think they all seemingly have made up their mind that it's okay to use this term refugee. I might end up getting in trouble and I might, you know, I might jeopardize a promotion in the future by being that girl that came in here and told them what was what. But my great grandmother marched with Martin Luther King. I could not, you know, and I'm not saying that like I'm some martyr because guess what? I would have gotten another job, I'm sure. But I couldn't do it because I couldn't be the one. I actually had readers call me when they would see things wrong in the newspaper. How did you sit up there and let that happen? So I also had that responsibility too. And I had to tell them, you know, guys, I can't control everything. But I did take my responsibility seriously. Some of it is not only just having people in the room, empowering them to speak, and also having them at different levels of the company, not just in the creative and out front fields, but in behind the scenes so that they can stop it before it even, as you mentioned, get so far up in the creative process that you're already casting for Kylie's, you know, police officer she's going to hand the Pepsi to, they should never have, no, that should never have happened, honestly. Thank you so much. No problem. Hi, Hi. so you mentioned um, fragmentation and, and how people have, like, a great ability to control, you know, what they see and who they interact with. Do you think the media landscape is getting a lot more fragmented these days in terms of people being able to self-select more and more specific outlets and do you think that's going to present like a big problem for the types of issues we're talking about? Well, I think it already presented a big problem. I think it has a lot to do with our election results, to be honest. I mean, and not to get super political, but there's proof that it's people reading erroneous information, people reading kind of race baiting or just plain um, not factual information had an effect on the way people voted, had an effect on the way people came out to vote. And 
I think we do live in a time where you could be in a bubble if you want to. If you decide to wake up and use one news source for everything and only go to those things that agree with you. Like I'll admit in my in my little circle of Facebook friends, most of us agree. When someone doesn't, it's really jarring. But that's actually not a great thing because then you're kind of you're being reinforced and you think what you're doing is right. You don't have any educated dissenter. I'm not talking about a troll. I'm talking about somebody who really knows what they're talking about. We are seeing more consolidation of news entities teaming up and working together because of a lack of resources. They almost have to work together. But I, I do think that's what I'm kind of afraid of is that people will become so disenchanted with the way that the traditional media is that they will just say, I'm not going to read that anymore. I'm just going to rely on this small blog with like three people that don't have enough people to do an investigative bureau and I'm gonna do I'm gonna go with whatever they say. So I, I think it is a problem, but we can head that off by bringing some of those voices into the mainstream and larger outlets. Thank you. Thank you. You, you touch on an on a issue with uh, the cost of journalism and needing to be able to, to sponsor and fund quality journalism. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at the numbers and shift, where in, in terms of the minority will become the majority, uh, those ad dollars will need to kind of be invested. Uh, there was a question that came in uh, from one of the colleagues, which was when you think of the traditionally black publications, um, their voice is really focused on, on their audience. Mm -hmm. With the shift in demographics, how do you see that is the kind of evolution for those publications, the well, Ebony's Jets of the world? That's a great question. So. I can say from my personal experience and what I observed, and Wendy and Melissa yell out if I'm incorrect, they worked with me um, at Ebony when I was there. Uh, sometimes advertisers seem to believe that they can get advertising in these black publications investing less than they would for a mainstream outlet, even if they see that the numbers that they're getting are very similar. And I think that's another systemic issue, the fact that you think you should pay less for the same, so that is a problem. And it's hard to really get hardcore with them because then they can take their dollars and invest digitally with some of these outlets that may not be as established, but it doesn't cost as much to invest that way. But again, journalism does cost money, good journalism does. You can't mm -hmm. do investigations, you can't be thorough. Sure, you can write a lot of opinion pieces that are based in existing fact, but you can't do any deep digging if you don't have money. So that, that is an important thing, and one that I think that the technology industry could assist with, if they could fund certain initiatives, if they could help um, maybe invest in investigative arms or invest in certain investigations, period, I think that that would be helpful. Um, it's, it's a very difficult question because one would think that the shift in demographics would mean a shift in budget, but it hasn't. And a lot of people point to the fact that, yes, there are niche black publications, but you know, I grew up reading all the different magazines too. I even had a situation, this was very recent, where I went to a car dealership, I, spoiler alert, I did not buy the car because I did not like this guy's attitude. He said to me, <laughs> I told him where I worked at the time it was Ebony, he came up with this wonderful anecdote, you know, trying to relate to me. He was like, you know what? You're going to think this is funny. And I was like, oh, my God, I know I'm not going <laughs> to He said to me that he loved Will Smith when he was a kid. He would buy Will Smith on anything, didn't matter what it was. He saw an Abity magazine with Will Smith on it. He goes, so here I am, this kid. I get up there and I buy an Ebony magazine. And I was like, and the punchline is what? And I was like, every day that I buy a magazine, these are not black magazines. No one, the cashier has never stopped me. I, I'm, I don't get the story. You know what, why don't we just go back to the dealership? And then I ended up buying a totally different car. But that's what I'm saying. Like, there's still this stigma and thought that it'd be weird for a person that's not black to buy this magazine, but it's not weird for me to buy a magazine that isn't black owned and doesn't have a black person on the cover. So, and this happened last year, so it's not, you know, some ancient tale I'm telling. And, and that says a lot about that situation. It's so unfortunate. It, it was for him and Teach his sale moments. too. Yeah. <laughs> he learned something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you won't tell that story again. But anyway. <laughs> Hi. Hi, my name is Latoya. I work on a team called the News Lab and um, we are all about working with journalists, technologists to help build the future of media. Um, I lead a piece of work on the team called Inclusive Storytelling. How do we elevate the voices that we don't traditionally hear in media? I'm just going to point out one thing. You okay. mentioned that you need sponsorships and dollars. That's exactly what our team great. does. Trying to, you know, increase. Uh, we support the Ida B. Wells Society, for instance, um, which is about training journalists of colors to be investigators.
investigative journalist. I wanted to ask you your thoughts on what more technology companies can do. If you think about, you made the point about Pepsi and people of color not having a seat at the table and not being in positions of power to right. say something. When we think about newsrooms, I think we've seen the numbers, the leadership. I think it's 86% of editorial directors, so on, are white men. Right. How do you change that? What does it take to shake up the newsrooms? Is it a matter of just hiring more people, going to find them? What's the role a technology company can play in, in really inspiring that change? It's something we think about. We don't have the answers, but it seems that that change comes down to getting more people with a seat at the table. But how do we make that happen? Well, you know, I, I really liked and was encouraged by what Google is doing with Howard University by creating this space where people of the university and students are interacting directly with Google employees, seeing what their future can be, seeing what the potential is. Something to that effect in the area of journalism, I think, would be very impactful. I do think, like what you mentioned, the Ida B. Wells, that sounds amazing. I also noted that Google is going to be a partner in evaluating the number of minorities in journalism for next year, which is great. Having that transparency is extremely important, because how can we fix the problem if we don't even know the full scope of it? Maybe you know, using technology tools to create um, job bank databases or helping create programs or fellowships that pay a stipend, as I mentioned the problem about news entities not paying or paying below standard, maybe in some way trying to help boost that amount of pay so that people can afford to enter the industry. And then training. So NABJ offers amazing training for managers and people want to go into the management track supporting those efforts so that you don't just have people who are the writers and they get on CNN and, yeah, everybody knows them by name, but they don't necessarily have as much power behind the scenes as these producers and these other people who are telling them where to go and what to do and what to focus on. So I think that what you mentioned is a great start and just continuing to do that and also making it easier to find people or candidates it would be important. I think um, technology is very helpful in that it connects people that might not otherwise be connected. But what I find that it does a lot of times is it just makes it easier to connect with those you already know. And I would love to see some technologies that push you beyond that. One of my mentors and former managers, Jane Hurt, that worked at the Tribune Red Eye, what I love about her is that she would go out of her way to go find people of color, people you know, representing different areas of the gender spectrum. She did this you know, with a conscious thought, this is what I'm doing, and not in a way of this is a token hire, but this is a super talented person. I'm going to work with this person. I'm going to make sure that they feel welcome. I'm going to make sure that their voices are heard. She will ask you, what do you think about this? You know, in a way that doesn't make it feel like you're being pigeonholed. And I think it's, it's also that, the manager mindset of not bringing someone in so you can just take a, a staff picture and look like you're doing something, but really making them part of the process. And she did that really well. So I bring her up as an example of what I would love to see more managers do. And I'll be at NABJ in August. Or okay, I'm sure you will. Yeah. New yeah. Orleans. All right, cool. <laughs> so there is this photo on the screen that I have to ask, what's the story? <laughs> I just like the way I look at it. No, I'm just kidding. So, um, so I went on the reel, uh, I think it was what in the the end of last year, yeah, December, uh, to talk about, which is another important thing and something that companies can support. It's uh, like the Root does their own version of this. A lot of entities do. The Power 100 uh, for Ebony was a way to highlight people that are doing great things, not just entertainment and celebrity that you see every day, but people in technology, people in nonprofit, people in the business world. And initiatives like that are important because, again, it's that see it to be it mentality. So I was really happy to go on there. The ladies were lovely. They were very kind. You know, I didn't get to drink whatever was in that mug. I'm not sure what it is to this day. But um, <laughs> yeah, it was it was a great and empowering experience. So I, I think we just we need more initiatives like that. There are many people of color across the globe doing terrific things. It saddens me that sometimes those people don't get the attention that they deserve. And I think that if we can work on our media coverage, work on our media newsrooms, we will see more of that. And, and the problem will not vanish overnight, but we will make a lot more progress. We are strong believers. Our CEO has even said a mix of diverse perspective and ideas and backgrounds will only lead to better products and better experiences. Right. And I, I, I'm hopeful. Um, I guess as a, a final question, sure. it would be, what are you most excited about for the next couple of years? What I'm most excited about is twofold. So I'm excited by 
people of color deciding that they will invest and create media outlets, show, TV shows, that they were showcased their talents and that they're doing that and that they're getting a reception for that. They're not waiting around. They're not begging people, please write me in or please cast me. They're taking matters into their own hands. I think we're seeing a wave of content creators of color that are making a big splash. It's not a niche thing. It's not something that just a handful of people are seeing. You see that with Issa Rae. Um, you mm -hmm. see that with Donald Glover. These are not people that are just trying to be stars. They're trying to make opportunities for other people. And I think that that's great. Jordan Peele as well. Um, the other thing I, I'm very excited about, and some people in the industry might disagree with me on this, is the audience power. I love that the audience can get you right together really fast. You know, I, I, I used to, when I was in the newsroom, I know people used to hate when the phone would ring. They'd hate emails from the public. I love them because that's how I can do a better job. How can I do a better job if I have no idea what the reception is? There are some people who live in this little ivory tower and they think that the public doesn't have the savvy to comment on what they're doing, but this you're doing it for them. So why can't they have a two-way conversation with you. I love the fact that people get dragged on Twitter. Sometimes it's funnier than others. I think it's appropriate, though. It's You're putting something out there. You can't dictate to me what I'm going to, to engage in or what mm -hmm. I'm going to like or hate. And I love that. So I think we're seeing power to the people, so to speak, and also power to the creators. And that, I think, is exhilarating. And I, I'm excited to watch where that goes. It's fantastic. You've been an inspiring and powerful and beautiful voice. We're so lucky to have, have the opportunity to have a conversation with you. It's an honor to be here. You'll Thanks. see another friend later at the conference. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you again. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. So great to see you.